So let me introduce to you our three speakers for this evening. Our panel is very distinguished, and notice the gender, okay? <laughs> Dr. Saray Paranje is our first speaker. She's chair of our Department of Surgery here at Newton Wellesley Hospital. Second presenter is Dr. Yolanda Colson, and she is the chief division of a chief of the Division of Thoracic Surgery at Massachusetts General Hospital. And then last but certainly not least is Dr. Lana Shoemaker, who is Director of Robotic Thoracic Surgery and Program Director of Robotic Surgery at Mass General Hospital. And notice we have Newton Wellesley and Mass General Hospital. We really have become an academic teaching institution with this wonderful merger of Mass General Brigham, and there's so many positives to that. And I'm sure that many of you are aware that we are going through some restructuring, and so I want to introduce to you our um, new president and COO, Ellen Maloney. So Ellen will take the reins March 1st, but I need to tell you I've known Ellen for my eight years on this board of trustees, and we are in excellent hands with Ellen. Great. So Ellen, please, Thank if you, you want to say words. Well, good evening, everybody. It's so terrific to see some old friends and to be able to make some new friends this evening. I am so excited, uh, humbled, and honored to take on this responsibility. I want you to know, and I know you know this, Newton Wellesley is a terrific organization. We couldn't be in a better healthcare system being Mass General Brigham. Our team is committed to ensuring that we remain the community, academic community hospital, here to take care of all of you and your families. So thanks for being with us tonight, and I look forward to uh, meeting and working with each of you. I also want to give a shout out to the development office and to Katie Conley. Katie is a vice president of development at Newton Wellesley, and she has amassed a phenomenal, phenomenal team. So much so that I will tell you, the several board members took her out to dinner last night <laughs> to tell her just that, how great she is and her team is. So Katie, why don't you stand and get an applause from us? <laughs> So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my distinguished panel. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, well, it's great seeing all of you um, tonight. And I'm Saray Parangi. This is my family. I'm new to Newton Wellesley. I've only been here three years, but I've been living just down the street for 24 years um, in the same house I bought when I moved from San Francisco. Uh, my husband's chief of urology at BIDMC, and my two boys, the, the younger one is a pre-med and working in biotech in Cambridge, and my oldest one has made his own PR company. So if you ever need PR, let me know. <laughs> um, so uh, the Department of Surgery is a full team effort. We're all in it together along with everyone else. These are my division chiefs. The top three are my associate chairs, Dr. Paranjape, Dr. Partridge, and Dr. Francone. Um, and the division chiefs of our various departments, vascular, breast, thoracic, neurosurgery, ophthalmology, OMFS, you can see we have a pretty broad group of different kinds of surgeons at the hospital. Um, everyone mentioned Mass General Brigham. We are part of a system, and our goal in the Department of Surgery is to align our goals with the goals of the system and to help you know, make sure that we are uh, all rowing in the same direction towards our goals. And one of the big goals I wanted to emphasize tonight was sort of the integrated care that we give at New Wellesley with patients at the center. So I'm sort of highlighting the things that we've been able to work on. And then providing easier access to care um, and investing in entertaining our outstanding people. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about those themes uh, in surgery. So the strategic priorities of the hospital, improving patient access, navigation, and retention to provide seamless care across the system. So what can be done at Newton-Wellesley should be done at Newton-Wellesley. What cannot be done 
because of whatever reasons or resources we would not do and make sure we use the systems that are available to us. Um, and then providing uh, the basic secondary care, surgical, affordable, closer to home. And I think everyone here tonight probably has used the hospital in various capacities, even if, even if not in surgery. And then I think both uh, speakers will prove our point about innovation at Union Wellesley Hospital and how important that is to keeping the hospital current for your care. This is our Department of Surgery goals, and again, you'll see a theme of the things I've highlighted, improving patient outcome and experience, making sure we have innovative programming, and making sure any cases that used to be done at academic settings that could be done closer to home are done safely closer to home. So the proof is in the pudding. Have we done such a thing? Have we shifted any cases that could be done at Union Wellesley in a safe and efficient way? And here's just an example of the kinds of um, cases that we have moved, care of the patient that used to be done at Mass General, difficult parking, difficult to get in and out, and, um, and really didn't need to be there and could be done safely at Newton Wellesley. Um, year over year, in the last three to four years, we've shifted a lot of those cases across a variety of areas. So again, general colorectal, oncology, thoracic, vascular, pediatric surgery uh, in a safe way. And I'm, we're going to focus today on thoracic surgery, but just to point out that this is a broad effort that requires a lot of different kinds of resources and implementation. We have a lot of physicians at Newton Wellesley, I'm only listing the surgeons who are best of Boston, who give you care closer to home in a variety of areas. We also have the 2023, but I didn't make the, the cut, this new slide in time. We're gonna focus on thoracic surgery today. So Dr. Geisert's not here, but he's been leading the thoracic surgery division for, for over 20 years. He's been a fantastic leader, seeing what to grow and what areas to bring in. And he was really behind recruiting Lana in, and her robotic expertise and bringing her to New Wellesley. And then we also have Dr. Hugh Ashenklaas, who has been at Newton Wellesley for four years and is doing an amazing job. Uh, you may know his brother is the congressman and his father is now taking Dr. Fauci's job. So pretty uh, big, uh, big, uh, big family in healthcare right now. Um, uh, one of the things that I do want to emphasize is when you bring new programs and you bring a lot of new kinds of surgeries and you expand things, you have to make sure your team feels comfortable in the new setting. And one of the things we've been able to do in a very multidisciplinary fashion, so with Dr. Goldstone really leading the work, but we've had anesthesia, we have plastic surgery, we have nursing, we have um, uh, preoperative nursing, we have physician assistants who made this onboarding team, which we called All Aboard. Um, but this team was an effort to make sure every single surgeon who comes to Newton Wellesley gets at least a two hour orientation by various members of the team to make sure they understand the culture of the organization, they understand what resources we have and maybe what resources we don't have. They meet people and they understand how to schedule things, they understand. Uh, so when they show up to do their first case, they're well supported. And if they show up in the middle of the night, for example, in the far right, people may only show up to do call cases in the middle of the night in an emergency. We want to make sure they're very oriented to the facilities and what we have. Um, surgery is very much a team sport. You know, you, you can't be a surgeon unless you have a really solid team behind you, and our teams are super solid. Here on the uh, big side here are all of the staff in our um, sterile processing unit. They are making sure the instruments are clean and are, are available for the surgeons when we need them. They work super, super hard. They're actually an amazing group. We have nurses, we have uh, CRNAs, anesthesiologists, um, and no surgeon could show up and do any of the work that we're going to talk about today unless we had that team. Um, I'm going to start focusing a little bit on robotic surgery because that's the theme for today. And what I want to say is that 
Um, robotic surgery started at Newton Wellesley in 2018, so it's been about five years, so it's a good time to think about the growth. Uh, we initially had one robot, and in um, 2022, uh, we put in a second robot. Um, and as you can see, there's been tremendous growth. And I really think, first and foremost, we have to thank, thank Dr. Francome. We managed to get him from Leahy Clinic. He was a visionary in terms of robotic surgery, and um, he was a colorectal surgeon in himself. But what he had seen happen at many hospitals is the robot was bought, one surgeon was brought in to use the robot, no one else was trained, that surgeon left, nothing happened. The robot became a very expensive you know, clothing rack. Um, and so what he did from the beginning, which I really think was essential, was make sure that many different services, all those colors you see at the bottom, were trained and started using the robot. And as you can see, as we've expanded, we've continued to make sure that there's a great mix of cases being done. Um, and so this is one example of the kind of robotic surgery that we're doing. I show this for a reason. So up there is the room that we had to retrofit to bring the second robot in. And the reason I say that is um, other hospitals, let's say big ones like Mass General, but a couple of robots, they literally rolled them in, plugged them in, and everything got started. As a smaller community hospital with an older facility, we couldn't do that are actually the ceilings did not have the proper structure to hold the weight of the booms and the things needed. So we actually had to empty an operating room, stop the surgeries that were being in, done in there for eight months, fix it, costing millions of dollars <laughs> to be able to bring the robotic equipment. So I wanna thank leadership for seeing that vision and thank all of you for supporting that kind of work that we do. And these are our happy people. And the physician assistants, I wanna say, really make our program special because they're the ones who day in, day out are always helping the surgeons and really make an amazing part of the team. And our actually lead PA, Robin, won the Advancing Innovation and Progress Pillar of Excellence Award recently. So we're very thankful to you for being here and we're very thankful to our team. And I'm gonna let Yolanda talk a little bit about lung cancer uh, as the next step. Thank you. <clears throat> so this is quite an honor. This is really great to speak about because it's something that I've been passionate about for probably two decades. Um, and uh, became very interested in some of what I'm going to talk about here long before we had completely recognized what it was and that there was a difference. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is lung cancer and the difference between men and women. And we didn't really recognize that there was this difference, but there is this difference. Are you doing this way? So there's a couple things on this slide that are important to look at, and that's the global incidence of just cancer in general. And the different types are in different colors, and you can see men versus women. And women have a higher incidence of breast cancer than men. But if you look at the bottom, the red line, lung and bronchus uh, has increased over the years, and it's kind of second. And then you can see the same on men being second to prostate. What's important is both prostate and breast, however, although they're the most common, are not the ones that are the most deadly. And that's what becomes important. Because when you look at this and you realize in women, lung, more women are dying of lung cancer than breast, ovarian, and uterine cancers combined. And so we think about those as women's health issues, but we don't think of lung cancer as a, a women's health issue. And it is because we don't think about it. We think about the you know, Marlboro cowboy, and that's the person who's smoking the cigarettes and gets lung cancer. And you're gonna see why there's some other differences. So this is just actually showing when we look at the estimated number of new cases on the top, but if you look at the actual death rate, it's the number one cancer killer in women is lung cancer. And then it becomes important because we started to look at how can we make this better? And there's been a big push about looking at lung cancer screening. And there was a whole big debate about, do we need to do this? We're exposing people to x-rays. How can we do this? And they actually did a trial. It was a government funded big trial to look at it. And what we found was that there were thousands and thousands of lives that were saved by doing lung cancer screening. 
and it was pretty profound. It's one of the most effective screenings out there. Now, the studies were conducted in this fashion, however, that came up with guidelines. And this is the current guideline set, that if somebody is uh, between the ages of 30, uh, 55 and 88, you can see over there, but they've had a 20 pack year history of smoking. So that means one pack a year for 20, one pack a day for 20 years or five packs a day for four years. It doesn't matter how you get there. It's 20. Um, or if you've smoked in the last 15 years, those are considered the risk factors from that study, but you're going to hear why that's important in a second. But that's about a quarter of the U.S. population. So about 15 million people qualify for scanning every year, which is a huge health problem for us to figure out how we're going to scan 15 million people. The worst problem is we're only scanning about 10% of those that are eligible. That's a real problem because these are the people we think are at the highest risk and we're only scanning 10% of them. When we do that, about a third of the scans will have something abnormal on them. Doesn't mean it's a cancer, but it's something that needs to be investigated, which now means we need to sort out who do we have to worry about and who do we not have to worry about. When you go through, about 5% or so will need a biopsy or some invasive procedure, but only about 4% of the total number that you've scanned and found something on will have a lung cancer. So it's small, but this becomes really important because those ones that we find, we're finding are so early that we can actually start to cure them. So here you can see Newton Wellesley's data and the impact that it's having. Because if you look at 20, 2015, when these guidelines came out, it was hard to get people started and you had to set up the program and you had to follow all these people because they get one scan, but then you have to follow them to see what happens to that nodule. So we have this continually increasing number of people that we're following and the logistics of following all of these people every year are hard. So you can see how rapidly it's increased and now it's over 700 people every year that are getting a screen. And if you look at the stats, every year versus follow-up, it's increasing. And so we're looking at ways of managing them. How can we tell quickly? And Mass General has been doing work on how can we use computers to actually scan quickly and decide who's, who we need to follow close and who we don't. So that's the kind of technology we can bring in and incorporate here because we do all of the scanning together and we read them that way. Now, this is why this becomes really important. And why it's important is if you look at the number of lung cancers that we're now detecting, you can see the number of patients that we have found now in the latter years that are really important because they would not have been found any other way because for the most part, people don't have symptoms for their lung cancer until it's quite advanced. And if you look on the diagram in the far left, what you're seeing, stage one is very early, only in one place. Stage two is it's kind of spread to the nearby lymph nodes. Three is even further and four is it's outside of the chest. So if you look at that, in the past, the vast majority of people were into the threes and fours. We've now shifted by these studies that the vast majority of patients are early stage curable lung cancer. So it's a huge difference. It gives me chills every time I say it. So, so that is a huge shift because we have now had, and it's starting to impact cure. So we're now starting to see better and better results. But why does this matter? Lung cancer is slightly different in women. There are women who smoke. There are women who have these risk factors and they qualify for scanning and all that data fits. The problem is there's a number of women that aren't smokers and they don't have the exposure or at least not directly smoking. They may have jobs like a waitress. They may have jobs as a, as a flight attendant, places they're exposed, but there's some that are never exposed. And that's some of the research that I've been working on for years, trying to figure out why do these people get this? It ends up to be almost about 20%. So it's not small. So they have environmental exposures, and we're going to talk a little bit about the cancers look a little different, the histology is different, the types, what it looks like, and then some of the treatments are also different. So this is kind of what we talked about, the smoking versus non-smoking, biologic differences, and this environmental exposure. And if they've had breast cancer, they may get radiation exposure to the, to the breast on that side. So that's another risk factor that they have. Globally, here it's about 15% of all types of lung cancer, and about half of the women sometimes in different groups are attributed to not smoking. 
Okay. And so looking at that and how to do it, we do not have a way to determine who should get screened and not screened because we don't have any data to do that. So we don't, we can't screen everyone, every woman because the numbers are in the 4%, right? So you can't, it's, it's, it is a real challenge for us. And so we've been looking at different ways, new blood tests, new ways to look at that. Okay. So what's different about what it looks like? Classically, lung cancers are big, solid things that look like, you know, marbles. Okay. If you look here, I've had to circle it because you can barely see it. And it's like a cloud. And it has to do with the way it's growing. And it's growing kind of along the little air sacs. And so you start to get these, these kind of parts solid. So if you look at non-smokers, women of Asian descent particularly, they have a much higher incidence of these type of looking uh, tumors. And they can have multiple of them. And they're not related to smoking. What is interesting is about 15 to 20% of them are never smokers, and we don't know why they, they get this. And what we do is we watch them to see if it starts to get more solid. If it starts to pile up on top of each other, it's like it's not behaving. They're not lining up. It's just like, you know, they start to get a little chaotic. That tells us we need to get that one out. We can look at it. We can biopsy it. You're going to see how we can localize it because they're not hard. You can't feel them. Okay. And that's what we really look like. And they tend to have very specific gene mutations that cause them. Okay. Most of these are really slow. They take years to grow. And that's also different from typical lung cancers. Now, this is the gene that's very different. And if you look here, you can see on the closest one, if you are non-Asian and an ever smoker, you can see that the little thing that says EGFR, that's a specific gene, is about 28%. But if you're an Asian never smoking, it's 68%. And that's a gene mutation in the tumor that makes it susceptible to particular drugs. So we know something is triggering those cells, and that's what we're looking at. But this is the kind of information and technology that starts to tell us, oh, we need to look at this because this drug is better. We need to look, we need to watch this patient population so we can start to scan those and do these things. And that's the type of stuff that I think is exactly why we have this partnership because we have people working on this. Then it goes to the community very quickly and we can say, you know what? We've got data that suggests this. And so we can look at it so everyone gets the, the, the same treatment. And if you look at current smokers, you see KRAS in blue shows up instead of EGFR different drugs, different treatments, and how we do that, okay? But nobody would have thought about that if they hadn't started looking at men and women different and if we hadn't started looking at some of the gene mutations. Now, why does this matter? The la latest data in the last year that has come out, this is what's called a survival curve, and the straighter it is, the better your survival, and if it does this, it means that over time, some people are dying. This is quite long. This is five years out. And what they found was that they actually could put patients who had this EGFR mutation, even if they had surgery and we took it all out, a percentage of them would always recur. By putting them on this medicine that blocks the EGFR, we now have the blue line. That's a significant difference in what we call the curative surgery that we're now bumping it up so a lot more people, and that's gonna become the standard of care. And what's gonna happen in women who have this, we actually think we can cure significantly more than we could in the past, okay? So lung cancer is different on a bunch of different varieties, and we need to think about that that way. So more women who are non and never smokers, um, are, they don't meet the criteria, but it's important that we consider them and think about them more likely to have these ground glass things that look like it and things that grow really slow. The good news about that is they tend to have really good survival. So if you hear that they have lung cancer, the most important message I think we can tell people is that number one, we're finding them early. We have ways to prevent recurrence and they grow slow. So we're now seeing significant changes in survival, and outcomes. It's not like there's nothing to do. It's a huge different change now. These mutations are common and lung cancer is absolutely treatable and curable. And it's becoming the majority of our patients rather than the, the, the small. So that's my whole role is to tell you we have things to do and treatments to do. 
And I think now we're going to let Lana tell you how we do it. OK? All right. Great, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and, and be able to talk about my passion and share that with all of you today. We have some videos, just a little disclaimer, not a whole lot. So uh, <laughs> surgical videos. And I, I did cut out a few because I get a little excited and like to show way too much. And they're like, no, no. Uh, so I get to talk about my passion of, of bringing robotic surgery to treat what Dr. Colson was just talking about and, and make things less invasive so it's easier on our patients to recover from and go on to their therapies that they may need, either chemotherapy or these new targeted therapies. So actually, the first uh, robotic surgery was uh, done by uh, Dr. Melfi in Italy um, in 2002. It's taken this long for it to really develop. Um, but through the years, we've seen it slowly, slowly increase um, to just even like a decade ago, it was still only 11% of cases being done for uh, lung cancer, robotic. Um, and we've done studies that have shown in the beginning, like, okay, we're, we're doing this and it's equivalent to the other way we used to do it, which was a big open surgery where we'd actually like cut the ribs and spread them apart. And it, it was really challenging for our patients uh, to recover from that. So this is just a little picture of, actually it started in the 1990s of, of robotics being developed, the early 1990s. These were some of the first systems I think it's kind of entertaining to look at and then compare them to now. And we've seen, you know, there's been kind of one main dominant surgical robotic company. Others are, are definitely coming along, so we're excited about that. But you can see the change in the systems. The, the bulkiness of that robot has gotten a little bit sleeker and uh, easier to use. And so with that, we're getting more and more advanced technologies that go with it. We use kind of near-infrared imaging. I'll show that to find these little nodules. Um, the uh, visualization is actually impeccable. So it's in, I can, when I look through these vision towers, I see in 3D and HD and 10 times normal. So that's one of the advantages. And I use these instruments that are like my hands. And they move like my hands, but they're about that big. So it really is uh, is great. And then this is an example of uh, one of Medronic's uh, robots that they've developed that's going to, it's uh, FDA approved in uh, to be used in Europe and some other countries, not yet FDA approved in our country, but hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll see some more competition, which is also really good um, when we look at costs. But here's the, you know what we've seen in our trends of going from the big open surgeries, um, which is uh, the, the top line, now it's coming down over time. And now we're seeing the robotics, right? That black line really kind of skyrocket up. Um, so we're happy to, to see that and, and be part of that training process. This is a large study that I was involved in where we looked at 21 institutions across the country and looked at the way we used to do it to another minimally invasive way without the robot and then one with the robot. And, and what are the outcomes? It's because we, it's really important to make sure that we're doing the best cancer surgery we can for our patients. Um, and so that's just an example of one of the incisions that you might get, you know, if you had the bigger open surgery, just compared to the smaller little dot incisions. And so we actually found that there was shorter hospital stays, less complications, less blood transfusions, and less conversion. So when using this technology to traditional minimally invasive technology without the robot, we, were com we had significantly less conversion. So that's the robotic group in the blue and the other minimally invasive br group in the green. So we're able to do harder cases without having to, to do the big open incision is what that shows. Um, so we're really happy to, to, to show that point. And then we also did a study that um, just out of our group here um, at MGH Newton Wellesley. So my doc, my partner, Dr. Auchincloss, is on this study as well. And we wanted to say, okay, what about the advanced stages? You know, are we still able to reproduce what we showed for earlier stage lung cancer? And we were able to show that yes, we have less conversions, we have shorter hospital stays with equivalent survival. So that's always important. Can you do this job just as well as any other modality, if not better? And that's why we want to push the envelope to be able to do that. So I just wanted to show this is uh, an example of you know, how the robot looks. Someone's on their side, and these little incisions go right in between your rib spaces. And I just thought I'd play this. I don't know if any of you have seen it. I heard that they had a robot at one of the events, and some of you got to play on it. So unfortunately, we don't have one here, but next time. 
Um, so this is it coming in and we'll attach it to these little, what we call ports that allow us to put the instruments through those arms into the body. We sit at a little, what we call a video console basically and control everything. So it actually helps. It's quite ergonomic for the surgeon. I've operated in a cast before and through two pregnancies. And so it, it definitely helped me in that. But I just wanted to show this as an example. And this is where it gets a little gory. So please tell me if you don't like it. But this is an example of a gentleman that came to me. He was an avid golfer. He had a large tumor kind of invading the lining of the heart, had chemotherapy before, still had this large tumor. And he was like, well, I don't want to have this unless you can do it robotic. And this is probably the first time I did one where I'm taking out the whole lung. Um, this was several years ago. Um, but he, you know, I was like, yeah, we'll, we'll do it. And uh, we did. And so this is where it gets a little gory. There's the heart. And we had to take off the lining of the heart because that's where the tumor was, was involved. So there you see the heart beating. And then we'll divide the blood vessels that are actually going to the, the whole entire lung we had to take out because the tumor was so large. And so that's just us using these robotic stapler devices. So we're controlling all of that. And these are our little instruments that we're working in there. That's his airway, and then, then we'll divide that. Are you guys okay? <laughs> and then this, this, okay, don't look at the top. But this is us, then we're reconstructing that lining of that heart, and we can do that all, and then we just, you know, we take it out. We put it in the, everyone's like, how do you get that big tumor out? We put it in a sack, and it seals up. It's like a fishing net, and you close it, and so it doesn't touch anything, and we we squeeze it out. So, so this guy did great and, and went home in a couple days. So he was happy and back to golfing. So <laughs> I'd like to show that, but back to the non gory stuff. So we're, we're evolving in what we do with robotics. So this is our current system where we use four little incisions and, and they're coming out now, not yet approved for what we do, but hopefully in the next several months is, is a single port. So one incision and these arms come out and work. And so you don't have to have the other little ones. And, and then we're going to also talk about another system that's called a robotic bronchoscopy. So that allows us to drive through the airways using this robot. So we drive through and we can find these little nodules and we can at least like dye them because we're finding things so early, which is what we want to do because we want to cure patients and find them in early stages. And so this helps us find them and biopsy them and uh, be able to treat them. So this is kind of hopefully this pictures not too bad, but that's kind of the image that we go when we navigate out there, we drive out there, we confirm this little picture at the bottom is, is like an ultrasound to show that we are at that lesion and then we dye it. And this green is the near infrared imaging that we use to, to highlight it. And so we can see it um, if, because some of these things like Dr. Colson show they're they're not even made like a solid mass yet. They're in this ground glass and it's very hard to, you can't even feel it if you got your hand in there. And so this is really helps us find these. And so this is a little video of, we dyed a couple little nodules and we're able to just take them out. And, and so it was make the you know, patient went home like the next day, you know, so it's, it's really nice for the patients and this technology has really helped us out. There's the green again. So that's that's all I have. For, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the the future is bright, right? Um, but that, so that's what we bring to the table for robotics, and it, it's come a long way, and I think it'll continue to come a long way. But more importantly, I wanted to highlight what we're doing at Newton Wellesley as a community. So we've really worked on building up these programs, these lung cancer screening programs, these nodule programs, finding patients early trying to educate patients and, and bring awareness. So we've, we've done a lot with, again, same thing, a great team. We had, you know, they have National Lung Cancer Screening Day that was on November 12th. So we opened up spots at Newton Wellesley. And this is, we're kind of you know, coming out of our pandemic. Everyone's, it's really busy and people are trying to get their scans, but we reserve spots a whole day for patients to come and get their screenings for, you know, so I thought that that was just such a nice event. We're going to do it every year, but that's one way we really want to reach out to the community and, and bring awareness. So we really work hard through our social media networks and all throughout Newton Wellesley. And, and we do talks constantly on raising lung cancer awareness. So, and then on um, Indigenous People Day, we also had our lung cancer screening team there handing out brochures and bringing awareness. So we're really trying to do a lot of outreach um, to, to find our patients that need help. 
And so just to summarize everything, I think with our robotic technology, we've been able to bring this minimally invasive advanced care, you know, not just MGH, but really built it up at Newton Wellesley. So patients are getting the same thing. They're, they're home in a day or two. Um, so they're having great outcomes and quicker recovery for our patients. And now we have this robotic uh, bronchoscopy, hopefully coming soon to Newton Wellesley, that are going to allow us to, to identify smaller nodules and, you know, it's continue to expand on lung cancer screening to really improve detection and save lives. And, and like we had mentioned before, I think we're all doing research in artificial intelligence to see how we make things better, how we can streamline our care. And so that's going to be brought all throughout our community. So thank you for this opportunity. It's been really great talking to everybody. So now it's questions and answers. And um, I'd like to entertain some questions from all of you. For, um, I do have one question. What's the cost of a da Vinci? Because I used to support 43 OAs at the Brigham for three years yeah, yeah. and had to do the budget. Well, so now, so there's, there's quite a variation overall, this new, the new one, and there is a new one coming out um, that's going to have even more bells and whistles, but about... Uh, Two a million and a half to two million, but there's all kinds of packages, and now they have this paper use, and and you know you click and pay, and all kinds of things. So yeah, it is. Um, but I think that what we really try to do is is have those excellent outcomes where we are getting patients home. They're they're not staying in the hospital. So we kind of we, we, through all these years and looking at costs and the savings, if we are able to get our patients out without complications, without conversions and getting them home, there's a, still a cost benefit to that. Yeah, and that's where I don't agree with that. Yeah. I mean, that's really, um, what about primary care physicians? What do we do in their education about screening? So I think it becomes really important that we do these kind of outreach and we have conversations with them. And, and I think it's really important we do it to patients because unlike other types of screening, there has to be this shared decision making where you have to sit and talk about the patient to the patient about you're going to get a scan, what's the risk of x-ray to the scan. And, and, and I think the other thing that's really different is the stigma that comes, even if you're a non-smoker, invariably someone will ask you, did you smoke? Which sends a terrible message to them that they deserve to have this. And so people, one, don't want to get the scan because if they have something on it, even if the majority aren't cancers, they have to tell their family that they had a nodule. And then everyone says, I told you, mom, you should have stopped smoking. So the stigma is huge and is preventing people from getting scans. And so, we're trying to work on ways of telling how to do, streamline some of the, the, the um, shared decision making, trying to get that so that it doesn't always have to be a physician that does it. Could we get it so a, a physician assistant or a nurse or someone can do that so there isn't a bottleneck? And then really educating people that we are doing such a difference in finding them early that it's not this death sentence, that if you get your scan, we can actually figure out if it's a cancer or not, then we'll follow you so we get it earlier. Or if it is something, we can get it earlier and you can move on and not be ashamed of it. And I think that's what's really important. And I think the, women, the people who aren't smokers who have it are actually a really important part of the puzzle because it diffuses this whole, you deserve this. Because there's a lot of people who, I mean, none of them deserve it, right? I mean, in general, nobody deserves it. But we can't connect it. I just wanted to comment of, of what we do, because you mentioned how do we outreach with the, the PCPs in our primary care. And so we do, and they may be sick of us a little bit, but we do, we provide, um, Newton Wellesley has these uh, lunch and learns. And so we outreach to our primary care and we give talks, you know, there are different topics every week, but we are always signing up to do this talk about lung cancer screening to raise awareness. And the other thing that I wanted to mention too is something that Dr. Geiser had, you know, we talked about, he has been a chair here for 20 years, started, um, what was it, 2018, a lung nodule program. So these incidental lung nodules, now there's a direct, just 
you know, click on a button and it sends a referral to our, our clinic where we can see these patients. So these, this is like someone coming through the ER or had a scan for something else. And so it takes that burden off of our primary care physicians of having to follow them with repeat scans or what to do. And so we, we take care of all those patients. So Dr. Geiser had started it and we, we continue it on um, and it's grown and really made a difference in, uh, for these patients as well. I've never smoked, but I grew up in the 40s and 50s with parents who smoked like crazy mm -hmm. in a very small house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and we know that that's kind of come. We don't have a great way to track it. And so some of these people who are never smokers probably were exposed. In general, if you notice the other part of the, of the criteria is we tend to say the last 15 years. So if you were smoking for the last 15. So we kind of think risk seems to normalize down, not maybe exactly to complete normal if you've been a heavy smoker for a long time. So our thought is if you were exposed as a child, we don't think you probably have still a risk as you get older, but we still look for that. And people who are waitresses and, and flight attendants were particularly quite exposed. Now, not so much you don't smoke in the plane, but it used to be in the day, everybody smoked in the plane, right? So, so I think that's what, we're, and bars, bartenders, and, 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 and so if you look at that, those people do have an exposure risk. And we actually, when we talk about history, we talk about, you know, what's their occupation? That's why we do, that's why we ask those questions. So the risk is there, you know, but not as high as, yeah. you know, so it's, it's all about weighing the risk benefit and, you know, it's a small percentage, but it's not zero. So I'm one of those as well <laughs> with my parents, but yeah. Me too. I grew up in the, uh, both parents smoking and uh, definitely uh, it was, it was very special era. Yeah. I hope never to live it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, in, in, interestingly, my parents were both uh, enrolled in the national oh, really? uh, screening mm -hmm. trial. They were both randomized to chest x-ray. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But, the, the, so the trial looked at chest x-rays compared to this low dose green. And so the, the chest x-rays weren't as detailed as, as the other. Yeah. We don't do that. Yeah, but my question is, is there a possibility of combining different screening methods? Mm -hmm. Like mammography is a very common screening. Could you do a multiple chest x-ray and have it be something that you could be able to detect breast cancer as well as like lung cancer? Mm -hmm. So there has been discussions. Um, it's harder to detect breast cancer on just a chest CT than it is a, ma a mammogram because, because the fat in the breast makes it hard. So they tend to compress the breast tissue to see, as all the women in this room know. <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we aren't as good at that. But I do think your question's really valid because what we're trying to get to is you could, there's new methods out people are really looking for. If you breathe in a tube, can we detect, there's these volatile things that come from the tumors. Can we start to look at uh, uh, blood tests? They're finding single cells within blood. So I think in the next four or five years, I think we're gonna see there there is a big move, which is nobody wanted to do CT scans on everybody all the time. It's it's. It's a low risk. It's like flying, I've been told. It's like flying to Europe. And so people do that back and forth, but we don't want to just x-ray people to x-ray people. Um, so I think there is going to be a way to do that. And with the addition of artificial intelligence, if we can start looking at a nodule and say, the likelihood that this becomes a cancer is one in a million, I don't have to keep scanning them to follow them. So I think we're gonna get much sophisticated. We kind of are using a big hammer right now. And I think it's gonna be important. And I think the same's gonna happen with breast cancer, actually. I think we're gonna end up doing similar, yeah. less invasive tests. What do you have to do to keep the robots happy? <laughs> Use them. Use them. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, we have a team that just maintains them. The company maintains them. So they generally um, don't have too many issues. But I think that, uh, you know, the more you're using them and, and keeping them in tune, it, it helps. And the arms have to be changed every X many uses. So they do change they out the right. arms. Yeah. Yeah. What are the types of robotics surgeries are patients are going to be interested in? 
Okay, I can answer that. So uh, a wide range. So robotic prostatectomy for prostate cancer, extremely common, and we're very busy in the urology area. Um, uh, robotic gynecologic surgery, so removal of the uterus, removal of the fallopian tubes, um, that kind of surgery. Uh, colorectal cancer is another area uh, where there's been huge development uh, in robotic where very tiny incisions um, and um, if, if, for example, the whole, even the whole colon needs to be removed, it can be done robotically uh, with much shorter lengths of stay. Uh, but as you saw, basically every kind of our surgery can be done. Um, my specialty is thyroid surgery, so I used to say that's the exception, but it's not. Mm -hmm. So we can also do robotic surgery through four incisions in, two, in the armpits uh, and, and near the breast area and tunnel up and remove the thyroid, even robotically. Uh, we don't do that yet at Newton Wellesley. Um, hopefully, I'll be retired by the time we do that. <laughs> so I don't have to. Yeah, I think to teach a, a, an old, what do they say, a, a trick pony. It's going to be, I'm, I'm, I might be a one trick pony. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. If I can learn, you can learn. But, it, but I do think the other one that's really important is sometimes we get tumors in the middle of the chest. So thymomas, things of here. And we used to have to divide the whole sternum and open because there's no other way to get there. Right, so we would we would divide the sternum and we open it up. And the reality is to be able to go through these small incisions, and you can see everything better, and you can work across and then put it in a little sack and take it out is huge because they don't have pain of breathing. Right, so it's it's actually really cool. First of all, thank you. You are brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> what are they teaching in medical school now? Is it robotic? No, that, that's a great question. So, you know, medical students typically decide, for example, they want to do surgery or they might want to do medicine like Dr. Friedman's area or anesthesia like Dr. Chung. But once they decide on surgery, um, they enter the residency. And in, in, in the residency, our goal is, for example, in general surgery or thoracic is to teach them the breadth of things that they need. So typically we would start from actually open cases so the or simpler cases. And then once they learn that, um, then we move on to more complicated cases like robotic. And interesting that you asked that. So uh, Todd Francone has set up a whole robotic curriculum at Newton Wellesley. Um, and actually, when we acquired the second robot, the company threw in a simulation robot. So a third robot, essentially, to be used by residents for training so that um, at, at any given time they can practice. And there's a whole curriculum for them to practice. And then in the room when the surgery is being done, the surgeries that Lana showed, there is a second console. So a resident can sit at the console. And while Lana's operating, they can watch and learn the movements she's making from that second console in the room as well. So there's a lot of progress. And I think for medical students too, now they're coming into the rooms, they can see the anatomy so well. Well, because sometimes when we're doing surgery and, and open surgery or whatnot, they're trying to peek in you and it's, it's hard for them to see. So they might get a glimpse and then they're like standing back here. And, and so this allows them to really get a, a great understanding of the anatomy. We try to outreach to the medical students and do lectures to them and whatnot to expose them to that. Um, and there is like a, an interest group and all of that. So we try to keep them engaged and they are. So it's, it's exciting. And I was just going to make one last comment. Interestingly, what in the initial phases of robotic and laparoscopic surgery, it was found that the medical students who practiced video games a lot were better at it. So <laughs> one benefit of video games. <laughs> yeah, just saying. <laughs> so. Yeah, you could biopsy, yes. That'll be, I think, they're starting trials on that to do treatment. But I think that's the down the road that we will be able to. We have to prove the efficacy of that and the accuracy. But that is definitely what the thought was behind designing all of this and putting the cost behind it. One of the things with cancer is it's, is it's great if the treatment kills 95%, but it's not great. It has kill 100 so if we put it in there and it looks like it has it, one of the advantage of surgery is because we took it out, 
So we, we know that part's out, right, and done. So that's one of the reasons when she said we got to make sure we treat those is we want to make sure that it's not like, okay, it's less invasive, but there, it's going to come back. So that's one of the things I think we're going to learn over the next few years. Yeah, so thanks for asking that. So that bring, <laughs> brings up the added cost, you know, of the robot. So I know Lana said, you know, or let's say approximately $2 million, and then we had to put in $1.5 million to renovate the room to put in, bring able to wheel the robot in. And then we also had to put in, um, I think it was around $700,000 to put in specialized cleaning machines downstairs um, in our central processing unit because when it was built, it wasn't built for robots. And so essentially it's like a little, I hate to say, but like a drive through, oh, yeah. like a car wash. Yeah, it's like a car wash. It's literally like a car wash. And so they load all the arms and the whole thing and it goes through like a car wash. And then the internal parts get inspected um, actually by little scopes, like, like the bronchoscope, instead of going down the lung, it goes down the arms and checks to make sure everything's been properly cleaned. And that's why you showed the picture of the, the, Team. the teams. That, I did, that, yeah, because they're really, it's very critical and, and labor intensive, and the equipment needed uh, to clean these things is very much uh, difficult. And, and it's hard to retain staff in that environment. Um, like right this minute, we're, we're 13 people short. And so the people who are there are working twice as hard and we risk losing them because they're going to get burnt out. So we're really trying to, um, it's a bounty to have moved a lot of cases uh, from academia into Newton Wellesley and being able to do it safely. But at the same time, some of the resources haven't kept up and we're trying to all the time make sure that we bolster all of those and make sure everything is prim and proper. I have a question. When you refer to smokers and non-smokers or never smokers, mm -hmm. young adults smoking these days. Well, I don't really know exactly what all they're, if you call it smoking or what it is, but the way it smells, it seems even more toxic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are we really worried about what's coming in the future? We are really worried about what's coming in the future. And, and it has to do, because we actually don't know what's put in much of that stuff. No, they don't. No, they don't. But there's, you know, it's like, okay, we've kind of figured out what's in cigarette smoke, but we don't really know, and it's pretty variable. And so there has been a, a fair amount of work starting to look at that. The problem is, you know that if you smoke a cigarette, you don't have lung cancer two years later. What you have is decades later, right? And so it's this wave that we're worried exactly about that group. So we don't know what the scanning is. We know we don't have to do it this year, but we're going to have to figure out what the scanning program is, which is why the blood tests, the inhaling, things like that, because that's a whole nother group of people. If we're talking 15 million people now, that's another group that's going to keep coming. And we've seen cases of we've extreme seen them. lung disease happen from yeah. vaping. Yeah. You know, from vaping, vaping. The, the vaping that, they that they're doing, really yes. Doing. So it's, it's definitely a concern and, and we have to, it's another thing we're gonna have to put a lot of task forces behind. Unfortunately, we have a job for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. But I don't think there's awareness. No. I'm just wondering about the robots in terms of insurance coverage. Is that, you know, just for safety reasons, I mean, I'm assuming it would sort of want to say that it's positive for insurance, but is there for federal robots? Yeah, I, I think they've actually embraced it because of the shorter length of stay, lower complication rate, and also because surgeons have embraced it. I mean, if you can work, for example, I'm just taking robotic prostatectomy. I'm married to a urologist. So I've seen the evolution of this. It's very difficult doing the prostatectomy. It's deep in the body. The pelvis of men is are very narrow and it's hard to get in there and suture. And so laparoscopy was a huge improvement, but the, it's like operating with chopsticks. There's no movement of the chopstick other than one direction. So now with these robot arms, you saw how they, re, you know, reticulate. And uh, so I think the insurance companies are are aboard on are on board now. As things get more expensive and people want to use it for, let's say, non-cancer or maybe some simpler operations like 
getting your gallbladder out, for example, um, I, they're fighting those kinds of things. But I think for more complicated operations, they're, um, they're, it's pretty smooth getting it approved. Well, you don't get paid more. No. No, you, you don't get robot paid. or the other. They just, it all falls under like a minimally invasive category. But if you look at doing like a simpler, something that it, it does not have high, like where we're looking that there's conversion rates and, and what we do, um, we're higher than, than traditional, like Dr. Prang said, like laparoscopic uh, surgery. So if you're not seeing that huge difference, then it may not be of the cost benefit and you need to show cost benefit. So like a gallbladder, like we mentioned, it's pretty straightforward. There are some cases that, that are extremely challenging and I think that you would benefit from having that technology, but for the majority, it's pretty straightforward and, and you don't need it. So that's where you're really going to see, you know, kind of like the, the sinkhole, the money of, you know, that's, that's well, the difference. The other, the other, the other aspect is not every OR has one. So you don't want to say, sorry, we can only do three or four operations today because we have three or four robots. Like we need to do a lot of operations. So that's the other part of, of the equation is it has to be cost effective. Yeah, in the beginning, I think some surgeons as they were learning were switching, but I think usually if we're going to have to open or, or convert, it's usually directly to open. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, we should wrap this yeah. up, but mm -hmm. I also, first of all, want to thank our speakers. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> it's outstanding. I also want to thank all of you because this was one of the most engaged audiences. I didn't have to keep asking the questions, <laughs> so I appreciated it more than I could tell you. Please join us for a reception. There's a vanilla butternut soup that Ellen and I have our eyes on, so please join us. And thank you all for attending tonight. It was really very special to have you. I love these conversations. Of course, I'm a nurse. I would love them. But I think, you know, just to think that Newton Wellesley has this technology and that we can make it available to our patients, how fortunate are we? But as you can tell, it's expensive. <laughs> so we need our donors to help us <laughs> subsidize this. So thank you. Thank you very much.